Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, inviting me both to contribute to the book and f uh, to contribute to this happy occasion. Of course, you know, being inspirational is a very big word. What I actually hope is that what I'm saying will be useful, and particularly useful to uh, young uh, people who are approaching the career ladder for an academic uh, position, and also for those who are wondering whether it is worth going for an academic position or a research position at all. And to the latter, I really dedicate the title, the title of my talk, which is paraphrasing Virgil, because the uh, her should be uh, him, uh, and uh, stress really the need to take risk and to stick to one's value and to uh, really storm the uh, working environment that we have uh, with a sort of healthy bloody-mindedness. Because I am actually not sure that the reasonable woman here is going to make a lot of progress. So I vouch for the unreasonable woman. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> with this start, uh, I like to say something about myself just to then frame what will happen later. Uh, I come from a tiny uh, village on the Adriatic coast of Italy and went to the high school in Ravenna uh, where I was a uh, head girl and uh, uh, developed what is called the uh, big fish in a tiny pond psychology. And that is quite a lot of confidence and not equipped for any criticism or challenge. Uh, so that, uh, but anyway, you know, I held to my uh, academic card very, very strongly because I uh, was in, from a controlling family and I wanted to escape. And so what I did, I applied for a, uh, to study medicine in an uh, old university with colleges. And although I did that uh, uh, because I wanted to do well, one of the main motivation was to put a few miles between <laughs> where I was and where I was studying so that I wasn't compelled, believe it or not, to go home every weekend. That was a great consideration uh, at that time. It was very important for me. So there I did well at Pavia. I had a, a good time. I made friends for life, as one does. But I also started to feel that there wasn't really a possibility for me to have a fulfilling career there. There was a lot of nepotism. It was very inward looking. Uh, and, but I also started to feel a pressure that uh, uh, I am sure a lot of you uh, have felt. And that is that when you work in an old and esteemed institution, even if there is absolutely nothing for you there, or there is no promise of a job or any good uh, opening for your career, they make you feel like leaving is like failing, right? That if you leave that institution, you're actually rusticated somewhere in the provinces, right? And, and therefore, you are compelled to stay, even though you're having a miserable time. Well, then I didn't like that at all. So I actually said, I'm, I'm off. And I went uh, to this colony, as it was called there, of the University of Pavia, the third chair of medicine, where I actually blossomed, because there was a lot there that one could do. So I got a tenure track position very early, two years after my degree, started training in cardiology. But then, you know, what happens after the first two exciting years is that I started to feel a bit claustrophobic. So I started to think, well, am I actually going to be here until I'm 65 or so? And I thought, mm, you know, I, I must uh, do something. And so I, uh, again, uh, with the hope of uh, opening my horizons and uh, learning English, because I did all of those uh, Latin, Greek, and things at school, but no English, and, uh, and that's a failure I'm still recovering from. Uh, I, uh, I arrived in Oxford uh, in 1989 with a number of little fellowships. I took uh, an unpaid leave for the job I had and so on. And then uh, in 1991, to my parents' dismay, I resigned my job in Italy and started a DFIL in Oxford. So with no financial security. In 92, I obtained a junior research fellowship that paid my salary, my fees. So I felt, oh, well, I'm, I'm fine, you know, then I can cope with this. Uh, I, I found a mentor, a sponsor. My colleagues were great. The environment was fantastic. And in 1994, my daughter was born, I passed my viva, I won the Investigator Prize of the British Cardiac Society, the first time to a woman. So at that time, I got to the, my 30, 
and I gave myself a 10 out of 10. <laughs> I said, I'm doing well, right? And this is actually what happens, right? Uh, because women do very well up until this stage. It is then after the, the attrition starts and the problems start. And that was the same for me. So what happens between 94 and 2000? Well, I started, I continued to train as an honorary senior registrar and consultant. Honorary means that you're not paid. You are, have a university contract and you write project grants to fund your salary. And that is a very uncomfortable position to be in. Uh, my head of department retires in 1994. And if you think when you're young, you may think that, that the head of department is a, some kind of ceremonial figure. When you don't have one, you realize the difference, yeah? because <coughs> nothing happens to your department, to you, there are no openings. And uh, my mentor and best friend in Oxford died of cancer in 1998. I applied for a senior fellowship from the British Art Foundation, a readership in my department, and failed both times. Uh, Isabella, my daughter, doesn't sleep through the night until she is seven years old. And, that is, uh, 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 and I think at this point, I do think very, very seriously, seriously that I might give it all up. And why do I think that? Because I feel isolated. Everybody's moving on with their career but me. I'm stuck in this. Uh, I'm starting to think why on earth I resigned my job. Uh, I'm always tired, I'm sleep deprived in a kind of state of permanent jet lag, and uh, I, I feel I'm not good enough. I keep failing. You know, my, co my colleagues get where they want to go and I don't. So I may, it's probably because I am not good enough. And the little money I make it goes into childcare, and that is another common experience and that makes you ask even more, is it worth it? And also I understand one fundamental thing that is pertinent particularly to this country, right, versus the continental Europe, and that it is socially acceptable for me to give it all up. And in fact, um, a, a lot of people encourage me to do so. It's a poor you syndrome, right? Oh, poor you, you know, of course you should be home with your baby and this and that. And so I, I am really that far from falling and saying, oh, I'm giving it all up, I go back to the NHS, I get a part-time job and that's it. But then I talked to my mother, uh, who has always been working, and therefore she says, ah, it's nonsense, you know, this, you, know, you, you will recover from this, uh, uh, you shouldn't give it up. And, uh, you know, I keep going and I write another grant and then I have some scientific breakthroughs, some nice data that come along. And within a few years, I got a senior fellowship, a readership, a professorship, a program grant, and all of that. And all of changed all of a sudden, right? You know, a, another title for this talk is the first uh, 50 years are the hardest, right? <laughs> <laughs> so hold on, girl. <laughs> right, so, so what is it that I've learned from all of this that I, can, I feel I can communicate? Right, first of all is what do you need and the first thing that you need is persistence. And uh, the, here I am quoting this president of the United States who said, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent or women. Uh, education will not. The world is fu full of educated derelicts. And I'm sure you know what I mean. Uh, so that is uh, point number one. Uh, so hold on. Secondly, uh, when I started uh, my career as a uh, researcher, an independent researcher, I had this in mind. I started working on human tissue at the time where this was completely unfashionable because uh, the experiment in human cells or human tissue on the cardiac side uh, were thought to be dirty, right? Oh, you know, these are dirty experiments. Why would you uh, use, uh, go through the hassle of getting surgical samples, isolating myocytes from that when you can have a guinea pig and they're all fed the same and all of that. So no, it didn't seem to occur that the two things may not actually translate. But, uh, you know, I did struggle with this, but I had this kind of vision that I would find something in, uh, in uh, human tissue, my species of uh, interest, and then maybe make a proof of uh, 
principal uh, uh, model in a mouse, taking into a large animal model and back into humans. And 25 years later, I, am, uh, I have a paper uh, from a clinical trial that is impressed in the New England Medical Journal. It has taken me that long to go all the way around it, but it has been possible to do so. And so my message here is that be ambitious. Right? Be ambitious, don't sort of, uh, because you haven't got anything in your hands, it doesn't mean that you should think small, right? And in fact, uh, I would exhort you to think about what you want to do next whilst you are doing what you're doing, then five years after that, and then 10 years after that. And that, although this is possibly science fiction, it kinds of train you to think big. Right? And to say, what is it that I really want to do? And that was uh, uh, the topic of a nature paper that said, if you only had five tokens, each one for one paper, what are the five papers you would want to write? So think about like that, because now everything that you are starting or will start to do would take a long time. So you really need to prioritize and choose carefully so that you don't get yourself into a hole and uh, you know, that may require the same amount of energy, but you are not really aiming high enough. So the third thing is this, too much advice is bad for you. Really, you should try to be very careful about this. And here, I'm quoting again from Steve Jobs. You can't just ask customers or indeed funding agency uh, what they want and then try to give that to them. By the time you get it built, they will want something new and something else. So you need to make up your mind of what you want to do. And you know the bandwagon is usually not a good uh, um, um, think, you know, to follow in the long run if that all the, is all that you're doing, right? Particularly because it would take you time to catch up with the bandwagon. And uh, also, you can't keep asking people what is it that you should be doing, right? You need to come to that conclusion uh, yourself. And that is uh, the way, you know, to try and be original. Stick to your guns. So the fourth thing is that you should be lucky, right? And actually, you do make your luck. This has been quoted many times. The harder you work, the luckier you get. The harder you practice, the luckier you get, right? And what makes a lot of your luck is your environment. And therefore, you need to pay a lot of attention to it. So don't accept a job. Even, you know, even a scholarship or a PhD student <coughs> without visiting the lab or institution and talking to your future colleagues. That will give you the thermometer of the situation. How happy are people there? Are they thriving, right? The other thing is that if you think you can do better somewhere else, do not hesitate to move, right? And that's what I did in Pavia. There's no point staying in a place because they are trying to hoodwink you that that is the best place you can possibly be. Open your eye and make your own decision. Be alert to opportunities that might come your way, and when you see them, grab them. You know, don't feel, oh, well, much shall I? No, you do go for it, right? So under no circumstances, you should be afraid of change. Change is fantastic. It's fantastic for your regenerating power, you know, whatever you, you may want to do in the future, and it's also fantastic for your salary, right? It is the more places you move, the higher your pay will be. If you stay in one place, you're not promoted you know, that, you know, to the same level. You know, they, they have you, right? So. so the other thing that I have learned, and that is something that I'm really keen to, for you to remember, is that people don't talk about their failures. But failures happen frequently and all the way to the top. So if you fail once, you know, it's happened to everybody many times. You pick yourself up and you go try again. And that is back to the persistence. Failure is normal. Don't take it personally. The other thing is that one shouldn't dilute one's energy by being too accommodating. This happens a lot to people who feel in a position of disadvantage, women, minority, you name it. So every time you are told to do something, like the graduate uh, entry committee, yeah, typical, uh, ask yourself, what is in there for me? You know, so learn to say no if there is nothing really for you at that particular moment. 
So the other thing is that, and I got, go back to my title, one must take risks, right? So in here, I say learn to say no, but also don't be afraid of saying yes. If someone or your institution or somewhere else is offering you something that may be challenging, is out of your comfort zone, but you could see it may lead into something. So say yes, you know, and find yourself sometimes by changing the scene, the place where you're working. You know, something that has been very useful for me has been to try my leadership skills outside my usual work environment. That has given me a lot of confidence. You may try that because your work environment uh, is something that you maybe feel less comfortable than outside or you, you know, you're afraid of upsetting people, that you tend to be meeker. Right? When you go outside, then you, know, you try and do and you say, well, but I'm as good as anybody else. So take any opportunities to test yourself in what you can do, even in places where you maybe don't care that much. So one needs a sponsor. This has been raised before. Someone that uh, will mention your name when there is a position that will point you towards uh, uh, some position and some things that you can do. But beware of mentors. And I, I actually think, and what I've seen working in a conservative environment, which is medicine and cardiology in particular, is that the mentors are very good for perpetrating the status quo. So if you are a young man and you are up and going and you go and find a mentor in a senior man in your institution, you'll be fine, right? Because the mini-me uh, syndrome will apply and they will recognize themselves and they say, I can see you are a future leader, right? <laughs> if you are a woman, then that is you, it's very much likely that you will be encouraged to underachieve. Because people will start, well, you may have a family and this and that, and you know, so don't, you know, don't go, don't aim that high, right? And so I think this is really something that I uh, warn you, you know, because I know the mentorship at the moment uh, and mentor schemes are very popular, but I think you need to be very careful. So the other thing is that one. <laughs> One must choose one's partners very, very carefully. This is true both for men and for women, right? Uh, I, the reason why I'm saying that for men as well is because men may think that actually having someone at home that sorts everything else uh, uh, is useful, but actually having a spouse that is coming home with a salary is giving the man more flexibility as well. You know, to take on maybe a more risky job because we have two salary, we can balance that out. Otherwise, one is stuck in one position. So I think this is actually important for both. So I have also learned that uh, if you are a woman, you are of course as good as anybody else, but you know, you may not be as high as your male colleagues in the kind of unspoken pecking order of your institution. This is very common, yeah, for the reasons that I have outlined before. Uh, what you mustn't do is think that this must be right, that you are uh, worth less. Because otherwise, if you do, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because you will always be a step back. And so the person who's put you in that back position will be reinforced on their opinion that that was the right thing to do, right? So remember that this is a game of confidence. You know, the academic life, you get criticized a lot. It is a game of confidence. And most of the skills are learned. They're not innate. Right? There are people who go for interview, fail, they practice their interview with 10 people, they succeed. Right? You can learn. You know, it's not something, oh my God, I can't do that. You can. Right? So because of that, it is particularly important to be open-minded and to welcome criticism because by doing that, you learn how to go about this game of confidence and convincing other people that you are worth, you know, that you're worth sponsoring and you're worth investing on. And so, you know, I again I have another quote from The Art of War. If you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles, right? And that is, I think, very true in our environment. So the last thing and last slide is about, uh, I come to my friend Wikipedia, which I sponsor gladly every year because I think uh, it's wonderful. And it's about the work-life balance. 
So the work-life bal balance, I think, is a concept that has introduced uh, what I would regard as a false dichotomy in our lives. And uh, uh, looking at Wikipedia, I found out that the expression work-life balance was first used in the United Kingdom in the late 70s to describe the balance between an individual work and a personal life, right? As if you have your work here and your life here, right? Before that, the anthropologist's definition of happiness was to have as little separation as possible between your work and your play. And I would exhort you to stick to the latter. Thank you very much. Okay, okay thanks very much. Um, it, it, it's interesting, actually, that some of the themes that I will say in my talk are actually rather similar to what we've just heard, which is not surprising, but interesting because, because my background is very different. But I'm not going to talk very much about myself. I'm going to talk about where I think we should be advising um, younger people. So... Um, <clears throat> Why would anybody want to be an academic? Well, and, and, and not have an NHS job to fall back on, to have nothing to fall back on. Why would anybody do that? Well, to, to those of us who are fortunate enough to be in this business, I think there are many, many reasons. I think it is a very special and privileged lifestyle. And, and I think we must not forget that. It isn't all about um, trial and tribulation. So obviously we all want the excitement of scientific discovery, but there's so much more than that, so much independence, so much freedom of thought. You could choose what you read, you can choose what you write. You work always with interesting and intelligent colleagues. You might not like them very much, <laughs> but they're certainly very intelligent, and that is a real privilege. Um, I have friends, as I'm sure you all do, who work in other walks of life, in the financial services and so on. They earn a whole load more money, but they probably don't find their colleagues nearly as interesting. So this is a real, real privilege for us. And we, we, I, I would encourage everybody who is young and interested to go for it. However, we can't pretend... Oh, also, sorry, beg your pardon, the other really exciting thing is to run your own research group, which I think is, is incredibly... Um, interesting and stimulating thing to do. You've got your own lab, your own students and staff, you're responsible for it, your ideas, sharing your ideas. This is something very much to aspire to and a very exciting lifestyle. However, it is not easy and it's particularly, it seems not easy for women. I think we've agreed that. Why it is, we're probably a bit uncertain, but, and there are lots of things about it which are very familiar to everybody in this room but they are important, and I, like Sue and many uh, uh, other people here, do spend a lot of time trying to support young women in this direction because perhaps some of the things nearer the bottom need to be thought about. Not just the competition for funding, not just the lack of security, the poorly laid out career route, long hours. It's also the combative and aggressive nature of science can sometimes be quite off-putting but also this business of patronage. Call it a mentor, call it a sponsor, but this is still a career of patronage, if you, just as it always was. And therefore, who you know, who's looking out for you, who's kind of in your field, who who's thinks you're good, um, is such an important part of this, and that can be very difficult. <clears throat> so. If we look at the Wellcome Trust, the Wellcome Trust have really made an effort, I think, to, to put some data together here. It's very, it's very small, obviously, but they are absolutely committed to doing this, and I think that their, their uh, website is very interesting on this. So they have, were, were very struck in 2013 and 14 to this distribution that it, we've talked about earlier today, this, this almost equal, if not more women, <coughs> at this level and then this going down and down and this is you know this is the story it hasn't changed it was like that when we came us older people came into this business and actually it hasn't changed so we can spend a lot of time talking about grants and and institutions but grants and institutions have changed so why has this situation not changed um, 
So they have done a very interesting thing, which I would urge everyone to look at, which is that they have begun a tracking of scientific careers. It's, it's quite complicated. I don't have the time to go through it all now. But this is an example. So this is a cohort of people, men and women, who came in 10 years ago. And they are tracking these people. And so this is 10 years of a career. And they are sort of doing it every few years. So it, it becomes kind of, you know, you have to spend a bit of time looking at the data to understand it. But this, this is just an example. So here are these people that came in. There were more women than men 10 years ago coming in to their PhD program and to their early career. Uh, and look what's happening. Ignore for the minute the unknowns, because obviously that's a problem. They are likely to have left science because it is quite easy to track, you would agree, through publications, whether they stayed in science. But look at this fall off of women. It's absolutely phenomenal. I don't think I've ever seen, even though the numbers are small, I don't think I've ever seen it so beautifully illustrated. And also when the fall off is. The, it's marked, if you look, so this is after they've been about five years into the business, four or five years into the business, it's falling off rapidly, okay? So we know that this is happening, we're aware of it in our own institutions, but it's just very nicely illustrated. And the Wellcome Trust want to know why. Why is it this particular period? Because after all, it's exactly the same for young men. The competition's the same, the aggression's the same, the patronage is the same. So why is it that they're sticking with it? I'm not saying I'm going to be able to answer this question, but they, they have made an attempt to do some qualitative research in this area, interview a lot of people, and what they feel is that there, by interviewing a lot of people, there seems to be a complete acceptance that the same challenges, I know we've talked a lot about prejudice against men and women, uh, and women, and I think those are very institutional, but I'm not convinced that they're there for the competition for grants, that people might disagree with me. I think the same challenges are there, but that women respond differently to the perceived risks. So the risks are the same for both, but we respond differently to them. So my message is not so different from um, uh, Barbara's, which is that we have got to be braver. We have got to be braver and we've got to be prepared to be more risk taking because maybe maybe it's in our makeup. Who knows that we don't want to take risk, but that's not true because women take loads of risks actually in their lives. So why are they so reluctant to take a risk about their science? So what's the answer? Well, I think you've got to be brave. You've got to be original, okay? You've got to come up with something that puts your head above the parapet. It doesn't matter whether I'm a man or a woman, this is about me. I am, I've done something good. You have to find a research area. This is what was just spoken about before. That is your own. That, you know, you're not, oh, she's just doing what her mentor did or her sponsor did, you know. I have been asked unbelievable questions like, what would happen to your career if this man were to be run over by a bus tomorrow? Well, actually, you know, I think I might be able to manage it on my own. I mean, it's unbelievable, but this is people's mindset. And to be fair, it's asked of young men also. It isn't just asked of young women, but you've got to show that it's you. And you've got to impress the scientific community that you are doing something important. And why you? Because it was your idea, you're doing it, and no one else will do it. And that, I honestly think that if you can do that, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman, you will be funded. So going back to the 1980s, I'm not the, ad, 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 as adventurous as the previous speaker. I did my PhD postdoc at UCL, and I have spent my whole career at UCL. So I have been nowhere, OK? <laughs> I am a Londoner through and through. I was born in London. I think it's the only place in the world to be. I travel <laughs> extensively, and I always am happy to come back to London. So the point is that I made a case to my institution that actually there was no point be going somewhere else. Why go somewhere else just for the sake of it? There are many women in our institution who have done this, probably more women than men, for obvious reasons. And the reason they succeed is, is they've said, a good example would be Francesca Cacucci, who trained with John O'Keefe. She would say, I've got my own lab. Why would I go somewhere where John O'Keefe is not? What would be the point of that? 
So it's not just, oh, you've got, to, you've got to move around to show that you're clever, to show that you're brave. You can be brave in other ways. Now, I had to be brave because this is Patrick Wall who really trained me, and he was quite a character. His treatment of men and women was uh, outside of the lab, was um, interesting, and I won't go into it here. <laughs> but but in, inside the lab, inside the lab, he was, he treated me exactly the same as he did these two other postdocs. So the three of us were postdocs together, and some of you may recognize these people. This is Clifford Wolf, who now heads up. Um, the neurobiology department at Harvard. So he has been very successful, okay? So, and this is Steve McMahon, who heads up the Wolfson Institute at King's College London. This is me. And this mad smile on my face is just uh, covering up the fact that I was faced with intense competition right next to me through my postdoctoral years. Both these two chaps, incredibly clever, incredibly gifted, and absolutely as competitive as they come, right next to me all the time. And I developed a strategy early in life, which I've stuck to all my life, which is plow your own farrow. Don't, don't get into this. Don't get into this argument. You might win. But actually, that was a risk I chose not to take. I thought, I will do something different that they don't want to do. And that's fine. And so that is what I did. So Pat Wall was very famous for being the first neuroscientist who ever really, uh, physiologist who ever worked on, on, on pain. Um, it, this was an area where there was a huge explosion in the understanding of the development and plasticity of the central nervous system. And I just thought, hang on a minute, nobody's ever asked the question of how pain develops. No one else was interested in it, honestly and truly. And I decided to create this field. And that is what I'm famous for. I don't believe I am a better scientist, I really am saying this, than many of my contemporaries. But I decided to create a field. And I, I completely thank Patrick Wall for doing that. He said to me, the only way to succeed is to have something that you call your own. And if other people like it, they will come into it. But it will be identified as something that you started. And I think it is a way forward. And um, so that, that's the end of my work. You can read about my work if you want to. The other issue is families. And I think we can't get away from that. Not every woman has a family. Not every woman wants a family, but, but a lot do. And people do ask me a lot about this. I truly believe there's never a right time. But this is when I come to the risk and the bravery. It's very brave to have a child. I think it is. It's a huge decision in your life. And it's braver still to have one while you're trying to maintain any competitive career. So it isn't that women aren't brave. They are brave. And they take huge risks. It's risky to have a child. The child might not be well. The child might need loads of extra attention. They always need attention anyway, whether they're well or not. So, I mean, and they never stop needing attention, even when they're grown up as well. So, you know, this, this is a hugely brave thing to do. So why aren't we braver about our science then as well? Why, perhaps it's that we feel we can't do them both. But, you know, and there's this concept of having it all. It's not about having it all. It's just about being brave about things. You just have to go for it. So I went for it when I didn't have a permanent job. And those two young men that I showed you, young men, they applied for all the same jobs that I did. And they got them, and I didn't. And that was my moment that Barbara talked about when I walked uh, out uh, in the park and thought, I can't do this. I can't cope with this competition. I'm not going to make it. This is, apart from anything else, this is personally extremely humiliating in the institution in which I work. These people are you know, doing so much better than me. And then I thought, no, no, come on, stick with it. And then, and then I was pregnant. And I was trying to persuade my head of department to let me apply for a thing that w Mrs. Thatcher brought in, actually, called New Blood Lectureships. And I had to go and tell him. And I was really, truly afraid to go and tell my head of department that I was pregnant. I was actually physically afraid. And when you think about that, that's appalling. 
but that was how it was. So I applied to my parish, I walked in and I said, um, okay, I, ju I just wanted to sort of say, uh, um, you know, that I'm going to have you know, a baby, but, uh, you know. And, uh, and he, he said, I won't say he was, because he's still around, but, but it was before the days when people had to speak in the right way to their star. <laughs> so he, he looked at me and he said, well, that's it for you then, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I, just like that. And he said, so I know you'll be going part-time. And then he said, part-time work, part-time commitment, part-time scientists, may as well give it up. That's it for you. I'm sorry, I didn't expect that of you. And this other. <laughs> so I just thought, so in my desperation to sort of, apart from, I mean, nowadays, maybe a lot of women might say, how dare you speak to me like that? But of course I didn't. And I, I sort of said, oh, no, 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 honestly, it's all like that, really. And I'll, I'll, I'll be coming back, you know, and, and, and all of this. And I, you know, I'm not, don't want to go part time. I want to go full time and I want to stay as a scientist, honestly. And I was really sort of, oh God, he's not going to let me apply for this thing. And then he turned around and said, yeah, but you know, Women who work are awful mothers. I just thought, <laughs> I mean, that is unbelievable. I mean, and, uh, you know, though, I then realised this is absurd. I mean, whatever I say to him, he's going to. So I just kind of, you know, I just sort of stuck with it. And later, to be fair on him, he said to me that he thought I was very brave in the way that I spoke to him. I didn't feel like it at the time. But, you know, it is about bravery. And people have different challenges now because nobody would speak to a young woman like that now. But the challenges are still there, but you just got to think, I can do this, you know, I really can. So I'm going to finish then with talking interest. It's really interesting what Barbara said about mentors. I mean, I really agree. Role models, mentors, I don't know. You know, there's a big push in this now. A lot of my young female colleagues say that they just go and listen to talks where people say, well, you know, I got a first class degree from Oxford and then I got a fellowship and then, you know, this is what you need to do. This is not helpful for most people. I mean, because it's great if that's the way they're going, but not everybody. So I feel that a good role model is not just a successful woman, but someone who speaks about how they achieved it or someone who speaks about it, but someone who has been brave, someone who has taken risks in her field of endeavor. They're people who make the good role models, but also people who really stay engaged with the challenges of the new generation because they are different now. And I think that's really important. And it's really interesting also, Barbara mentioned her mother, because I have to say that I do believe that mother's very influential here. And my mother was immensely influential to me. The, her, the, her life, the a book of her life was published last year. She was a novelist, but independent. I don't have time to talk about her now, but she absolutely believed in women. I can only put that in that way. Every young woman, every old woman, she absolutely believed in, in the sort of ability of women to do things. And she never, ever questioned uh, me, always, always supported me. And I think that, you know, that's the kind of mentor that you need. I was lucky that I had that mother, but not, you know, other women can do it for you. But it's not all about sort of just the trappings of success. That's what I feel anyway. Okay, thanks very much. Thank